So, before we begin, I'd like you to picture what you'd find under the Instagram hashtag sunset. How many suns appear from around the globe? Perhaps you see something from home, much as I picture the dying embers of a recent Sydney evening. People stopped, took their phones from their pockets and shot the sunset. I wasn't looking at the sky. I was looking at them, thinking of flashes of light that wink from phones in the evening. I logged onto Facebook later that night and this is what I saw. Multiplied versions of this. Um, I scrolled through, killed time, basked in a series of images. Quite a different sensation from the instant of shooting the sun, where there's a visual hunger to seize. Here I'll be using, is it, is it okay? Yeah. Here I'll be using Roland Barthes' Punctum of Time as a lens through which to explore affects created by network smartphone shots. Firstly, how do we experience the wound of time in uploaded shots on Facebook and Instagram? What temporal qualities are evoked first in the desire to shoot an instant and then in the resulting mass of networked images on screen? It's important to state early on that the punctum is a very personal response that manifests uniquely in different people. It's an affective precognitive piercing or a wound to the beholder, what Bart would describe as a supplement, what I add to the photograph and what nonetheless is already there. A particular image might pierce one person, but leave another completely blank. And that's the element of chance in a punctum. It is as Bart writes, a roll of the dice. How it comes into being, is unpredictable, it evades calculation. So for these reasons, I'm choosing an autoethnographic approach to hashtag sunset, my entry point into punctums. So hashtag, hashtag because it holds the idea of a labeled shot multiplied billions of times and sunset being a metaphor for the photographic impulse. So, Photography has been technically and metaphorically entwined with the sun's energy for a long time. The Greek etymology, photographia, is light writing, a symbiosis that's been taken up by many theorists. Bart wrote, from a real body, which was there, proceed radiations, which ultimately touch me, who am here. He's following the logic of a star, which emanates the past and reaches our sight in the present. The affect can be lightning-like, a sharp flare. That can be long gone and continue to glow in the mind as an afterimage. Odd contradiction, he writes, a floating flash. So to look at a sunset as a metaphor for a medium, we're looking at when the light first strikes the lens and that that's the moment of the photograph, and then how a sense of temporality emanates from that image. We're looking at how a sunset can exist with an awareness of passing time and the many endings it holds, including our own. This is curious in relation to hashtag practices, which promise categorization, repetition, storage. That which is doubled, tripled, quadrupled, doesn't really die. So to unravel these temporal qualities, let's delve into the punctum of time. Now, this isn't just the visual detail that strikes you from within the frame of the shot. Instead, Bart writes, I now know there exists another punctum other than the detail. This new punctum, which is no longer a form but of intensity, is time the lacerating emphasis of the noem that has been its pure representation. So some of the key qualities of this punctum of time are, it occurs in retrospect. It's revealed after the fact, when the photograph is no longer in front of you. And we're going to also look at Derrida's um, placement of the punctum 
how he says it can be both a part of the world of codes and a rupture to those codes. That will come later. So the tense of the punctum collapses past, present and future. For example, in looking at this portrait of Lewis Payne, Bart writes, the punctum is, he's going to die. He's on death row. I read at the same time, this will be and this has been. I observe the horror and anterior future of which death is the stake. Whether or not the subject is already dead, every photograph is catastrophe. The moment on the brink of disappearance, the visible presence of an absence. This ties in with something image historian Geoffrey Batchen discussed at a recent symposium in the London Tate, every day and everywhere vernacular photography. He said, I will suggest there is a homogenous impulse behind sunset pictures. The sunset represents the end of the day. Historically, it's a metaphor for the end of life. Therefore, we have potentially moving, even profound thoughts when we witness a sunset, when we pause for a moment to see it. Because of course, what we're imagining is our own sunset and we take photographs precisely in order to arrest the imminence of our mortality. So, all those smartphones that wink at the sun, are they responding to a deep set understanding of our own transience? Browsing through those shots uploaded that Sydney evening, one post in particular caught my eye. Was annoyed that my phone didn't work when I wanted to take a picture of the sunset. I'm comforted to know that Joel had it covered anyway. <laughs> he didn't catch the sun, but others could do it for him. I understand the comfort in this. There are many lenses out there ready to shoot. It's estimated that approximately 1.75 billion smartphones are used around the globe. Approximately 350 million photographs enter Facebook every 24 hours and 70 million go on to Instagram. The sunset could be reflected in all these screens, turned into data in cyberspace. Artist Penelope Umbrico addresses this idea in her work, Suns from Flickr, where she collected shots labeled sunset from one day on the social media site. Her work speaks to Julian Stalabras's essay, 60 Billion Sunsets, where this recurring visual trope was described as the distinct moment being swamped by the homogenous. Is that what we're looking at in sunset hashtags? Are these snapshots simply repetitions of a unary photography, what Bart would call the studium? Certainly many of the shots on Instagram adhere to cultural understandings of an idyllic scene. You've got your beach, your sand, the gold on the water, the colors of a postcard. They repeat, but this doesn't necessarily imply that the punctum can't be here. In fact, Derrida reminds us to be cautious of any binary opposition between studium versus punctum. Instead, he says, they compose together, the one with the other. The subtle beyond of the punctum composes with the always coded of the studium. The punctum inhabits, or rather haunts, the studium. So, does the punctum haunt this photographic space, and how so? For one thing, Stalabras's idea of a homogeneous blur of similar photos doesn't catch the urgency with which people pull out their phones to catch a sunset. The action of taking a shot is triggered by the piercing moment, a flash. Something struck me and I have to shoot back. The moment is disappearing and unless frozen, it will take some part of me with it into passing time. The punctum is awake in the lived moment. The response to photograph. Umbrico places this impulse in the context of network photos. She says, the first intent of the photograph is to say, I am here, it's my birthday, 
I love you. I want to show you where I am. But online, she gets the sense of the exact opposite. I quote, a photographic scene that says, we're here. We're here all the time. We're here everywhere, forever. And it is, in a sense, an eternal, timeless, spaceless algorithm. That is one way of looking at it. But in her critique of Umbrica and Stalabras's work, Annabella Pollen makes a point on personal significance. She says, the world is supped full with photos of children blowing out the candles on their birthday cakes. You know it, I know it. And yet the world is not suffering from a surfeit of photographs of your child blowing out the candles on his birthday cake on his third birthday. I look through my family album, and while each shot is an integral moment in time, there are recurring types that repeat in albums worldwide. A baby is born, a wedding captured, birthdays, Christmases, holidays. Much as each sunset is unique, there's also constancy. It will rise and fall again and again around the planet where babies are born every minute while somewhere elsewhere others are dying. The punctum of time could be read here via seriality. As Derrida puts it, is not time the replacement of the irreplaceable, the replacement of this unique referent by another, completely other and yet still the same? There is something beautiful in this grand scale pattern the punctum of time as a pulse that beats through shared experience. But is this what the hashtag produces by a repeating constants? Poised above the horizon in a live stream, many suns disappear, yet remain preserved. So here's the contradiction. The shots may seem permanent as data, impossible to lose, but they are subject to other forms of forgetting. My friend may be comforted that someone will catch the sunset, but how likely is it that he or I or anyone will seek that particular sun from amidst the billions in cyberspace? Uh, artist Joachim Schmidt articulates this in the same Tate talk I referenced earlier. He says, um, there are people who have six figure numbers of photographs on their accounts on Facebook and on Flickr. If they were ever to decide to look at them, they'd have to stop living at the age of 50 or 60 and for the rest of the time, just look at photographs. How actually were the previous decades? Anything interesting? He refers to another program that's recently been developed by a Swedish company called Momoto, a hybrid of memory and motor. Every two minutes, a small camera device takes a shot and automatically uploads it on Facebook or social media. What would the pictures look like? some blurred photos of the ground, other people's ties, the image is irrelevant. What matters is the comfort in knowing these moments have been captured, stored, seen by others, or as Momoto's slogan says, remember every moment. That could be reassuring, one sun never really goes down. But the punctum is not a reassuring affect, and it might be more comfortable to tame it. So now I want you to remember the image of the hashtag that you first conjured when we started this talk. What did it look like? Um, I've been collecting screenshots of the hashtag on Instagram, and each time I get a different collage. Some of these images might fit what you'd expect. That serial quality that you get in, say, these two examples. But then you also get ones such as this one. Take a look at the bottom corner. We have displayed abs. I'm not sure how this is sunset, but anyway. <laughs> Next one in the middle, more displayed abs. 
also unusual. And last one, another example, top middle. Calamari. I, I did not foresee calamari. <laughs> so an investigation of the most popular hashtags is revealing what other hashtags did these misplaced sunsets use? You do see very uh, similar ones in them. We've got things such as One Direction, uh, tags for likes, uh, things such as uh, dog and hair are also very popular. Nature. Um, tags for likes is perhaps the most illuminating. Uh, I can recall many times when I've observed someone obsessively watching likes accumulate for a photo. A friend exclaiming, I have 30 a few minutes after posting her sushi. <laughs> What does that mean, I wonder? The photograph has been assigned an accumulated figure with each like acting as a value judgment. There had been an exchange, a number attached. My friend was proud because she'd earned something. She wasn't looking at the moment of the photograph as a point in time. She was looking for the moment of feedback. Uh, Jose Van Dijk lends insight to this interaction when she writes, Pictures have become more like spoken language as photos are turning into the new currency for social interaction. Interesting choice of word, currency. There is an exchange at work that Baroncelli and Frietas call a recognition market in which contemporary individuals trade personal worth. Many of these Instagram shots have become portals through which to be seen rather than images in which to see. And chronic hashtaggers know how to appeal to their audience. They earn currency by appealing to the behaviours of browsers who scroll through without being surprised by non sequiturs. When I click through uploaded images, I'm a kind of window shopper. It has a similar quality to that of flipping through a magazine or flicking through TV channels. non sequiturs are familiar. On Facebook, for example, you might get an ad for shoes next to a photo of a friend's graduation next to a cat meme. But these unrelated images don't jolt me out of myself in the same way that the punctum of time does. And that's because I'm not looking to be pierced. I'm looking to kill time. So this mode of engagement brings us to Bart's work on mad versus tame photography. What is that? So tame photography is uh, if the realism of the image remains relative, tempered by aesthetic or empirical habits, such as leafing through a magazine, at the hairdressers or the dentist. It's mad if its realism is absolute and obliges the loving and terrified consciousness to return to the very letter of time, what he calls photographic ecstasy. So are we taming the punctum by shifting the tense of the photographic practice? These shots aren't created with a future audience in mind. Yes, they promise storage, but they are primarily for immediate consumption and affirmation of the now rather than the that has been. So once the photograph is captured and uploaded, what happens to the punctum affect? There is energy in that exclamation. I have 30 likes. It's the adrenaline of social endorsement. But is that the photographic ecstasy that brings the viewer back to the very letter of time? Comfort is the word that comes back to mind. And the punctum is not comforting. It's a wound. It's ecstasy. That's because it captures an impossibility. It announces, I am dead. This is the inherent contradiction in that portrait of Lewis Payne or the last view of the sun before it creeps over the horizon. So as Derrida explains it, between the possibility and the impossibility of the I am dead, there is something like a category of imminence, 
the imminence of death presents itself. Network display is a continual insistence against this haunting. These photographs do not say, I am dead, but instead assert presence in the instant. As Jose Benjik says, it's about saying, picture me now, right here, right now, I'm here. So, I look at the sun and watch the night come. It is comforting to think that a global network has it covered. If there's an empty moment in the day, I could kill time by taking out my phone to scroll, browse, looking aimlessly as my purpose. Then again, data sometimes spins itself into unpredictable forms and wounds of time pierce the usually habitual landscape. There is room for thoughts in high numbers. A friend of mine, was just browsing Facebook when a photograph of her father appeared under the title, You May Know This Person. Her father is dead. He had died of a heart attack just one year before. There it is, the wound, the roll of the dice, the lacerated emphasis of the noem that has been its pure representation. Thank you. That was great, Tara. Thank you so much. We're going to have Thank you, uh, a variety of students come up and ask you some questions. Okay? All right. Me again. Hi. Oh, no. Damn it. Sorry. No. There we go. Okay. Hi, Tara. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, recently, Polaroid photography has been making a comeback. Do you think that mm -hmm. a massive amount of online photos and temporality of images have driven people to adopt a more permanent uh, physical copy? And uh, if not, what are your thoughts on Polaroids in general and why they're making a comeback? Mm -hmm. uh, very interesting question. Yeah, there's, um, there's a kind of... Uh, a longing for nostalgia, I think, that has come about, perhaps because the majority of the images we experience are so fleeting. Um, and in a sense, you know, well, they're virtual, they're immaterial, but you certainly see um, some of the discourse that was behind the Polaroid happening in, um, say, Instagram lenses. Have you seen those retro lenses, like 1970s? And the curious thing about that is that a lot of the people using them weren't born in the 1970s or even around then. It's more about saying, um, you know, I'm, I'm infusing this picture with a sense of uh, nostalgia. It's kind of added on top. Um, and I think there is a bit of a tension, like you, like you suggest there, that people would like to have something that's a bit more of a memento than like a, an exchange. But it's sort of, um, I think sometimes then enters back into that exchange. So people uh, might take a more sort of retro looking image, but then think, oh, well, that looks really cool. I think other people will like that. And then it goes back into that whole uh, cycle. But yeah. <laughs> I hadn't really thought about that, but you're right, the various, like, if we think of the Instagram filters too, right? Which often add, um, the materiality to the image, which what existed in print photos once upon a time, that sort of you know like granular aspect to the the photographic in, image itself, almost um, makes it more material because it's almost like it's given a surface that it otherwise didn't have, right? And that it's super interesting that you're pointing that out. I like that idea. <laughs> Hi. Um, so in your essay, Killing Time, you discuss how more and more images are created for the approving gaze of others. So in other words, the photograph moment revolves around audience affirmation rather than the subject's personal experience of the reported moment. With this in mind, um, what do you think is to come in the future? Does our life become photographs or do photographs become our life? Does our generation no longer live for the memories behind photos, but for the gratification that comes from a well-liked photo? 
There you wow. go. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was really interesting. And I'd love to know what, what your thoughts are on this too in the room. But um yeah, I'm 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 getting the sense that uh if you're looking at a life that's been photographed, um we now have people who, as soon as they're, like, even before they're born, they have a Facebook account always. So you start from the, uh, the ultrasound is the first Facebook post. And then you've got several, several more that come. And um, the, um, just the size, the accumulation of images in one person's photographic life is, is too much almost to mentally map. Um, I think uh, it would be it is probably going to get rarer and rarer for people to um, look back on albums in the way that, that we used to with analog images. Um, the, uh, yeah, it's, there are some curious trends that I wonder about and I'd love to know what your thoughts are. Um, I think that the moment and the recording of the moment are becoming closer and closer together. So if you have something like Google Glass, for example, your experience is the recording, actually. You see the moment as, as it is in your um, live feed you're transmitting. Um, so this has all sorts of implications for how you experience the present mm -hmm. because you will be thinking other people are seeing this. How does it look, not how does it feel? But what are, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, it's a very rich, rich question. Yeah, it's a really rich question. Let's turn it back to uh, everyone in class because I'd like to hear uh, in designing the question, did you have impressions yourself? Um, I just was thinking about how a lot of people um, on like a Saturday, they'll go out to take Instagram pictures so they can, <coughs> they can post them and mm -hmm. like them. So not, they're not going out to hang out and do a certain thing on you know, like a Saturday. They're going out to get those pictures. Yeah. To post, yeah. to like... Does anyone do that in class? We'll just do a little scan here. <laughs> Hands up. <laughs> Does anyone have any other thoughts you want to share? Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, Shinley was saying we don't take selfies anymore. Uh, like, we don't know what we take them to, like, grab the page or yeah. or something. Yeah. Whatever. Did you hear that, Tara? It's a little hard from, from up the back. What, uh, that's okay. So when we spoke with David last week, he was talking about selfies and tourism. And he oh, yes. said um, that, and it, it, it was interesting because you, you mentioned this um, in, your, in your article and in your talk too, that we don't take selfies to have, and you know, to actually have something. It's a, we do it to, to brag. And there's these various other reasons, right? Like he was saying, to have an artifact is just one of like all of these other reasons why we do it. And, um, and it was sort of like, you sort of hinted at that with the sunset too, right? Do we really want to have the material thing or is it, is it um, the emotional aspect? Is it the ritual? Is it something else? And so, yeah. Did, did yeah, it, that, that, about that, that, yeah. Rings, that rings true in, in my thoughts as well. Definitely. Um, yeah. It's, it's, um, it's very interesting as well when you look back at um, what that means for a sense of presence. So if you go way back to the beginning of photography when people were really unsure about being photographed and in fact a little scared of it um, and it wasn't something you shared with many people at all, um, there were quite a few people who believed it would somehow take something from you, like it would make you somehow more, like it would steal your soul or somehow make you almost you know half half dead in a sense and now if you're not photographed it's the opposite it's um if i'm not photographed i'm not really here so it's quite a big big shift in what is relatively a small space of time yeah we yeah. got another question excellent hi um, hi Colin a mistaken identification. He talks about how he feels that once photos of people are taken, the person in the photo dies, even if they are still alive, because it is the moment in time that is gone forever. Do you feel this is the same for Instagram images? Yeah, it's um, I think um, 
I think that it I think that it's happening without people intending it as the result or being as aware of it because there is this sense of um if it's stored on the database then it's saved you know um there was a wonderful ad for a digital camera recently which showed um a father and daughter just a montage of a father and a daughter having a wonderful time together and it didn't show any cameras or anything and at the end it said i've saved my today i saved my daughter's life and it was about the fact that he'd taken pictures of her therefore you know her life really had happened kind oh, of thing wow. yeah wow. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah it's it's so on the one hand that's there's that talk about it's you know it's very secure it's not going to go anywhere because it isn't material so it's not going to decay but on the other hand the images are having small deaths um you know it's the there are so many shots that people will just either forget about because of the the number of shots in their mind um or databases do fail they do break down you get lost so yes there is a different kind of loss going on definitely i think um but people are more more keen to say you know here i am and i'm alive and um contradict that in a sense Mm. Guys, I'm yeah. Your question. yeah, absolutely. No, this is great. We've got a couple more questions here from the students. Awesome. Okay. Hi. Hey. Um, I kind of have two parts to this, to this question. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, you mentioned in your lecture um, a time when you observe someone obsess over the likes they received on their um, Instagram post. Do you think Instagram would be as successful um, today if liking pictures wasn't, or yeah, wasn't a thing? Hmm. Oh wow. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I can't imagine it being anywhere near as um, viral as you would sort of, as it is now, um, because so much of it, so much of the algorithm of how the images arise on your screen, say in the explore section, has to do with the numbers of likes and if there's a high number or or the people in your network if they've liked it, so the liking actually spreads the viewing of the images. So the more clicks a shot gets, the more it gets seen. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't imagine that it would um, thrive anywhere near as much without it. What do you, what do you think? Uh, well, yes, I wanted to ask this because um, I don't know if you've heard of the app ViscoCam. No, no, I haven't. Basically, it's an app and it was first used to just edit pictures. But now you can have an account and you can follow people and all that stuff. But the thing is that you can't like pictures and you can't see who. Oh, so I found with like me and my friends and like my people my age, it's becoming more popular. And mm -hmm. I've discussed this with my friends. We think it's because you don't have to care about likes and oh, you can just post whatever you want and that yeah, mm. you don't know who's following you and stuff like that. And? Okay. That's that's interesting. Yeah, I was gonna say I was gonna suggest the. Um, it seems like that's such an integral part of the difference between digital and social media shared images to say analog print images. Is there's this sort of like private experience from the the material you know historical analog image and then a, a key element it seems to digital images like those on Instagram is this social sharing right and it seems like that's so integral. So it's interesting that that this app is becoming so popular because it's kind of defying that, right? It's like, we don't care about the social capital aspect of it. We kind of just care about the putting it out there. Is that, can you tell me more? So you share images there, right? Yeah. So can you tell me more about sort of like, in terms of your experience, like what do you, um, what's the... I post pictures that don't make it to my Instagram. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's kind of sad because it's like pictures I know when a lot of likes on Instagram, mm. but I still want to share them somewhere. Yeah. And oh, that's very interesting. But then I also do kind of care because I know people are going to see it. Right. Yeah. 
Interesting. So it's kind of, do you think of that space like an album or how do you sort of conceive it? Because it's sort of like, so it's like secondary images. Yeah, pretty much. But then is it, do you think of it like an album or is it kind of just like, like a feed? Like this is what I'm doing, these are activities in my day? No, because like there's a lot of pictures I've added that uh, I just didn't want to add to the Instagram because they're kind of like throwbacks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Didn't add at the time, but I still want to share them somewhere. So. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. That's interesting. That's really helpful to know. Yeah, Terry, you and I both are going to have to go uh, download that app now. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I've never heard that either. <laughs> one, one more question here. Awesome. Okay, so my question is, uh, in your uh, paper, you uh, cite how people tend to feel envious of others on social media. And uh, it leads them to have behaviors such as like self promotion or uh, like an envy spiral. So, can you just comment about like non average users, such as like celebrities, <laughs> businesses, uh, or individuals who make money through advertisement or endorsements? Oh, good question. Um, that's a very interesting point. Um, it's, it's a very, you've raised a really interesting area of discussion there because when you think about somewhere like Instagram, somewhere a platform like Instagram a lot of our very personal shots are appearing mixed in with business shots with advertising and with celebrity shots so I think that in part the the envy of, of photographs is be, how would you say it's as though seeing all those photographs together may have affected how people take their personal photographs um, because they are all on the one screen. Um, it is also curious to think about how businesses and advertising will use uh, Instagram via what you call like the average uh, poster. So there are lots of teenagers who are out there posting their interactions with products. Um, and that's just their feed. It's not uh, quite often they're not getting paid all that much money, but they are being given money and that's, uh, I see a question. Um, yeah, about that, I've got a friend who makes about $3,000 to $4,000 a month by posting pictures of trucks <laughs> on Instagram, yeah. Okay. So I'm just on with the topic of that. Yeah, <laughs> oh, wow. That, like, yeah. people are actually using this as a living. <laughs> yes, it is. It, but it's such a, an interesting blur that's happening between promotional and personal. So these people are communicating to their friends and their network, but they're also helping the companies to sell. It's um, that convergence does change the way you make a personal memory. Definitely. It's more about your job, as you said. So it's really interesting sort of what you're saying because I've thought about this um, in terms of uh, the pumpkin seems to historically when it's been spoken about it's it's an aspect of the personal image where the you know, the person in the photo is someone we know well someone we have sort of like an emotional and even quite often a bodily connection with that we've met in person this person is like figures into our life and so when we see them there's this sort of um, image-based piercing, which is like a touch very similar the way the bars, when I read it, it's sort of like, it's very similar to like a physical touch, right? It's, it's touching, it's wounding, as if we can feel it sort of like in our body. But um, with, I thought about this as well, you know, with like micro celebrity and, and people on Instagram, um, you know, posting various images. And on occasion, I've, I've seen um, images that have pierced me in this sort of like pumpkin manner, but it's been in a very like strategic way uh, because yes. in Instagrammers who, you know, like um, who's, who are making profit off of these images, but it's like this strategic um, like corporate use of the pumpkin, pumpkin almost. So sort of like strategic, this, this use of um, this very personal kind of like interrupting style of the, of the image by people who are hoping to get gain or money from the distribution of their images. So I was wondering, have you ever seen this sort of thing happen? Or do you think it's possible to 
strategically use punctum <laughs> um, in order to affect an audience. That is such an interesting way of framing it. Yeah, I love that idea. Um, I think certainly advertising does does play on some of those. It does uh, strike some of those chords that are very personal because they want you to uh, feel that you need something. And to feel like you need something, then it needs to hit you on that deeper level. And sometimes it does work. Um, <laughs> absolutely. But yes, it, I think um, in a sense it can be faked uh, or, you know, um, applied. But um, it's also, you know, curious to think about how um, literate people are in photographs now because um, we deal with them all the time. We deal with them every day. Um, I think the way we read them is becoming increasingly uh, more complex. And I, I, I think quite a number of Instagram users might be more, um, I don't know if it's cynical or, or just kind of ready for it to happen. But yeah, there are definitely times when it will hit you and times where you're not even sure if what you're looking at is an ad or if it is a personal image because you're browsing Instagram. It becomes very unclear, so it can definitely get you there. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. I was uh, thinking about this in terms of, of your, your article as well when I was reading it because um, it seemed like, you know, Bar's notion of, of the punctum, and, and you describe this as well, is that the pumpkin, the, the pumpkin, <laughs> the punctum is, um, uh, it's, it's a wound, right? Like it's not a positive feeling. It's a, it's a mournful feeling. It's a painful feeling. And um, when I was reading uh, the various quotes you had of, uh, and I can't remember which theorists were saying this, but you know, like these multitudes of sunsets that we're seeing um, aren't saying, aren't forcing us to experience our sort of like existential, you know. Um, uh, this this existential moment of our mortality but we're sort of putting them there and in that process I'm wondering if like by encountering so many more uh, moments of possible punctum if we're like you're saying almost like becoming desensitized to the punctum or the possibility of punctum in Im images do you have any feelings about that or am I totally wrong <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, yeah, I think, um, well, I, I don't know how most of you would use Instagram or Facebook, but do you find that you use it mostly when you're, you've got spare time and you just want to distract yourself a little bit? Um, I find it's often on the bus or waiting for the train or something like this. It's, you know, there's an empty space in time and it's not, certainly in those moments, you're not looking for anything that's, um, you're not seeking something that will really move you, I don't think. It's, uh, it's a little bit like when you're really tired and go home and you just want to watch a really crappy soap opera or something. You just don't want to engage. But, um, but the thing is that ironically from, from that space, because you're in a state of um, relaxation or, or just drifting, that because you don't expect the punctum, it makes it possible for it to arise and be maybe less often arise, but be a bit more sharp. Um, so, you know, I've heard people talking about browsing through Instagram or Facebook and then a picture of someone they used to love turns up mm -hmm. and it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so it's um it, it, one of the ways Bart talks about it is a it's an arrow that shoots out from the picture mm -hmm. so the point is, is something that just kind of strikes really quickly mm -hmm. um so maybe it can it can hit harder but less frequently possibly yeah uh, I'm going to do one last question, just opening it up to the audience. And we've had a fairly, you know, good discussion about how the punctum functions. In talking about it, has anyone had that experience, specifically, say, browsing Instagram or some other social media platform where you've confronted an image and it's sort of, you know, like an arrow sort of pierced you unexpectedly? Like, whoa, I didn't expect to, to feel that. And 
Has anyone ever had that experience? And can you think of what this image, say, was, or what the context was? All I like, think about is um, the ASPCA commercials that just come on and you're like all alone. Right. And they're just really sad. Right. And you just like, did not see it coming. Right. And then you just become so depressed. And that's really what I think about the first and foremost. Oh. Right. And these are like uh, PSAs, like public. Yeah, I, you know, like not, Sarah McLaughlin? Oh, yes, yes, yeah. 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 I think that's, it's slight, well, it would be, it's slightly different because, you know, like ads can evoke emotions in us, but we're talking like specifically about, you know, Boris is talking about like this specific sort of um, image uh, that affects us um, kind of like unintentionally. Mm. Either. Go, go for it. <laughs> yeah, 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 go for it. Can you? Uh, there's like a web comic series that my ex really like. Yeah. And every, I'm like scrolling through Tumblr and then I'll see it and I'll be like, oh. Yeah. Oh, interesting. <laughs> oh, because the webcomic reminds you of your ex. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure. 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 Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Greg. Uh, mine is kind of the same. Mm -hmm. I was on, this is recent. I was on Instagram looking through photos I was tagged in, and as I was looking through, I went down to one that my ex girlfriend tagged me in. Mm. And it's kind of, you just remember the moment in that time, and it's not like, it's kind of sad, but. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it definitely affected, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, picture. <laughs> um, for me, it's it's more like uh, how I'm sometimes scrolling through like Facebook or something, and yeah. then I see like a picture of someone that I know, but then like maybe it's a caption that they say. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, one of my friends recently just had like her birthday, and then it's like, uh, and then it's like she's post like parent or something posted a picture on the wall, and then it's like your dad would be so proud of you that I remembered like her dad died like, a while ago and stuff uh. like that. And then that's just, it's sometimes like maybe not like the picture itself. But then what someone says, sure. with the, in addition to that picture, and that will sometimes kind of get to me. Right. And it's like, oh, he was gone. So yeah, was yeah. Gone. And it gives that picture a whole new meaning, right? Yeah. It's actual overlay. I don't, have, I don't have a specific example, but I think a lot of the examples feature with like nostalgia. So you'll see a picture and <laughs> immediately go, oh, that was so fun. Or I wish you could do that again. I don't know. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I know. I think, um, you know, typically when we think of, Bars Punkton, we, it, you know, it was written in the context of him sort of trying to come to terms with the, the, the death of his, his mother and sort of, you know, reflecting on her images and the loss and her, his loss. And, um, but I think like the, the Punkton itself, it lends itself to, as like a really good tool for analyzing sort of how um, the abundance of social media images we confront now, uh, how they affect us, right? Like how they um, materialize and manifest these emotional and bodily kind of like reactions, um, which we'll talk about for like three more hours. But <laughs> we don't have that, and I'm sure you don't have that either. But <laughs> Tara, we wanted to thank you so much for um, for taking the time to chat with us, and uh, we'll give you one last round of applause before we we stop. There. <laughs>